Good morning. This is Richfield Lutheran Church's video worship service for October 20th. The printed bulletin for the service can be found on our website, richfield-lutheran.org. Our gospel is Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. This gospel starts with disciples obsessing over who will be closest to Jesus, leading to Jesus teaching his followers about God's take on importance and power. Here, Jesus makes it explicit that the reversal of values in God's community is a direct challenge to the values of this dominant culture, where wielding power over others is what makes you great. When we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying for an end to tyranny and oppression. We pray this gathered around the cross, a sign of great shame, transformed to be a sign of great honor and sacrifice. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw us near with grace in time of need, and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God forgives your sin and remembers, God forgives your iniquity and forgives remembers your sin no more. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sin is forgiven. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire always and only your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our gospel is Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus asks, or the disciples ask Jesus to grant them seats of honor. Jesus responds by announcing that he and his followers will rule through self-giving service. This is the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When you're over at Cub, and you've been there for a while, going up and down each aisle, finding everything on your grocery list, and you're finally done with the hunting and gathering for this week's grocery shopping, how do you know which checkout line to stand in? Do you just stand in the first line you see? Or do you look down that row of checkout counters to see which one is moving fastest? How do you know? How fast and efficient the checkout clerk seems? 
Maybe the people in line have grocery carts that are overflowing. And then when you finally pick the right one, and you're finally next in line, huh, then the checkout clerk picks up the phone for a price check, and you know that you're going nowhere fast. Ah. You know, in the big scheme of things, it's no big deal, really. But it drives me crazy. I mean, how inefficient. Why can't there be one central line out of which everyone waits their turn in line for the next available open checkout instead of this crapshoot? Now, I know that the grocery store is busy and you can't always just push your cart right up to an open waiting checkout clerk, but this random inefficiency drives me crazy, especially when someone else just lucks out into a faster moving line. Hmm. Three times now, Jesus has told his disciples about the crucifixion and resurrection in what we call his passion narratives. This first time, Peter tells Jesus that this is not how the Messiah thing works. No way can the Messiah suffer, let alone die. No way, Peter argues. The Messiah is all-powerful, hmm. like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator, taking name and kicking rear end. To which Jesus turns and rebukes Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on human things, not on divine things. The second time Jesus tells them about his upcoming crucifixion resurrection, the boys are silent. Instead, they argue among themselves, who is the greatest of Jesus' disciples? They just don't get it. Jesus talks about the cross, and all they can talk about is glory and power. Jesus talks about divine things, about the kingdom of God, and all they can think about is human things, about what they know, how life works here among humans. In the verses right before today's gospel reading, Jesus tells them a third time about his upcoming crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus tells them honestly, plainly, and openly. Hmm. And what do the disciples do? James and John come to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus says, Okay, what do you want me to do? They say, We want the seats of honor on your right hand, and on your left, in glory. It's a good thing to know what you want out of life, to really know what you really want. It makes, makes it clear what to aim for. And if you can be honest and open about it, then people know what to expect out of you and maybe how to help you attain your goal. Well, we Minnesotans, with our so-called Minnesota modesty, are hesitant to speak up for ourselves. We don't want to appear pushy, you know. But truth be told, I don't think we're all that different from James and John here. Oh, maybe we would not be so bold as to ask for the seats of honor, but to know at least that we would have a table where we have a good view of the table of honor. I mean, is that asking too much? Well, James and John and Peter were there up in the transfiguration, where up on the mountain they saw Jesus in his glory, bright shining as the sun, talking with Moses and Elijah. I mean, that much they know. So somehow they know that's where all this is leading. Regardless of all that cross stuff Jesus keeps talking about, that is the end game. So they want to beat the rush and reserve the good tables while they're still available. To which Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink the cup of baptism that I will be baptized with? <laughs> James and John are like little kids here, aren't they? I mean, they see the puppies in the window at the pet store, and they want one. Please, 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 can we have one? Ha ha, can we? We'll take good care of it, we promise. To which the kids' parents say, uh-huh, you don't know what you're promising. Well, James and John say to Jesus, we can do it. Is this positive thinking, or, mo or confidence, or hope, or moxie? The other ten disciples are miffed. I mean, perhaps because of the outrageousness of their request. Or maybe because they were beat out in line by James and John. Hmm. I saw a t-shirt a while back. It said in big, bold letters, Jesus loves everyone. And then in smaller letters underneath it says, but he loves me best. <laughs> if there's more than one kid in the family, there's always that sibling rivalry, isn't there? Mother always loved you best. Isn't that just the American way, though? I mean, after all, which is best? 
Chevy or Ford or Dodge. I mean, someone's going to be first, the best. Is it going to be Vikings or Packers? Uh, when I pastored in Wisconsin, I saw a green and gold sweatshirt that said, my favorite team is the Packers. My second favorite team is whoever is playing the Vikings. <laughs> if you can't be number one, we'll at least beat out that other guy. I wonder, does that mindset carry over into how we think about Christianity and the church? I mean, is one church beating out another? One is better than the other? Or maybe if we're not doing so well, well, at least we're not blatant sinners like those people over there. Since that's the way how things do work in this world, where there is a clear number one and a racking and stacking of the rest with some clear losers, how can we not carry that mindset with us as we walk through life? And so when Jesus starts talking in riddles like, whoever wishes to become great must be your servant, whoever wishes to be first must be slave of all, well, our eyes glaze over and we return to what we know of human things. But is that how the kingdom of God works? I mean, same as here, with competitive sheep, maybe, shouldering each other out for those best blades of grass, all the while standing in this field of lush grass, as far as the eye can see. Jesus says, cool it, guys. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. You know how things work around here in this age. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That may be the human way, but it's not God's way. No way. You are blessed to be a blessing to others, to the whole world, so that everyone can live into the kingdom of God. Everyone. Jesus asked James and John if they could drink from the cup of baptism that Jesus was about to drink. And they asserted, we can't do it. To which Jesus says, the cup that I drink, you will drink. It's going to be tough. You don't know what you're asking, but you will do it. It's not the bowl of greatness that you were hoping for. Rather, it is a cup of baptism. It is the cross with which I will be baptized. A cup of passion, crucifixion, suffering, death, and, after three days, resurrection. And I will do it for you. As the Apostle Paul writes over in Romans 6, which is right at the beginning of funerals, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death. So just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too walk in newness of life. For since we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Because Jesus went to the cross, because Jesus drank of his cup of baptism for you, you too will drink of his cup of baptism. This, then, is how the kingdom of God works. There are no seats of honor. There are no good seats for which you have to stand in line. No, nor is there even a nosebleed section. <laughs> there aren't even any view-obstructed seats. Oh yes, there are seats to the right and left of Jesus but they are already taken, taken by those two robbers on the crosses to the right and the left of Jesus there on Calvary. While the human way is to have rectangular tables with definite heads and feet, with definite seats of honor, that's not how it is in the kingdom of God. Here the table is round and everyone is on equal footing where Jesus himself is the host, giving of himself for you. As we hear in Philippians 2, even though Jesus is the Son of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve you. And so he calls you, invites you to join him and serve others in love, as Jesus serves you in love. <laughs> Story of, is told of when Oli died, and he went to heaven, and St. Peter was showing him around. Now, for some strange reason, St. Peter wasn't saying much, just showing Oli around. First, they went on a long journey in an elevator. When they got out, lo, there was a sumptuous feast, 
At this huge banquet hall, as far as the eye can see, there is roast beef and butterball turkey and lutefisk and lefsa and squash with brown sugar and mashed potatoes with gravy and cranberries, both whole and minced. And pie, oh my, there was pie, you name it. Pumpkin and pecan and apple and blueberry and lemon chiffon. and Well, well they had everything and lots of it. And Oli's mouth just watered at the sight of it all. But once he got past this wowness of it, he looked at the banquet goers. Huh, they had on this stunning clothes, all velvet and lace and whatnot. But there was this oddest thing. Instead of hands, they had silverware. A, a spoon where the right hand would have been and a fork for their left. Well, isn't that different, Oli thought. But whatever, since all they do all the time here is feast at the sumptuous banquet, why not? But then Oli saw something else that was different. Their arms were three feet long, and they had no elbows. Huh. The result was which that they were all starving to death. Thin as a rail they all were, and no one was able to bring any of that sumptuous banquet to their lips. What a waste! Oli turned to St. Peter and said, You call this heaven? St. Peter said, No, this is not heaven. This is hell. And then, in a poof, St. Peter and Oli stood before another banquet feast. The same sumptuous food, the same stunning clothes, and oh yes, Oli noted, the people also still had a spoon for the right hand would be and a fork for the left, and here, yes, their arms were still three feet long and they had no elbows. Oli turned to St. Peter. What kind of cruel joke is this if this is heaven? St. Peter said, Oli, look again. Pay attention. This time Oli looked a little more closely. Yeah, same sumptuous food, same stunning clothes, same silverware for hands, same three-foot arms with no elbows, but there was a difference here. A big difference. Instead of each person slowly starving to death because they can't feed themselves, as in hell, here, in the kingdom of heaven, they were enjoying the food and each other because they were feeding each other, reaching out their long silverware arm hands into the sumptuous food and feeding their neighbor in love. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In response to this good news, we confess our shared faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation. Holy One, we give thanks for all servant leaders of the church. Bless bishops, pastors, and deacons with humble wisdom and ground them in your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. Creative One, we give thanks for the delicate balance of the natural world. Kindle in us a spirit of caring strength in the preservation of habitats, food availability, and centers of refuge that all wildlife may thrive. God of grace, hear our prayer. Empowering God, fill the leaders of government with a spirit of service that prioritizes those on the margins due to job loss, underemployment, unsafe working conditions, and immigration status. May economic equity be achieved for all people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Restoring one, send your angels to watch over, rescue, and protect those who are injured or ill. Nurse those who suffer hardship, disease, injury, or difficulty with your comfort and peace, especially the people of Ukraine, the people of Palestine and Israel, victims of hurricanes, and those whom we now name in our hearts. God of grace, hear our prayer. Abiding one, you call pastors to shepherd the congregations toward faithful living as servants and followers of Jesus. 
inspire all ordained ministers to ministry that challenges, engages, and comforts those in their care. God of grace, hear our prayer. Saving one, we give thanks for the disciples, James and John, and all saints who have faithfully served you. We rejoice in the promised place at the feast of victory that we will receive by your grace alone. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever. Amen. You can support this and other of God's ministries through Richfield Lutheran Church today via our website, richfield-lutheran.org. <clears throat> Thank you for your faithful generosity. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> On October 20th, in addition to this video recording and its phone-in option, we have in-person worship at 9.30. We celebrate Holy Communion. All are welcome. Afterwards, we have a special congregation meeting to call Richfield Lutheran's next pastor. Next Sunday, October 27th, is Reformation Sunday. Our Gospel is John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Jesus speaks of truth and freedom as spiritual realities known through his word. He reveals the truth that sets people free from sin. Until then, go forth with God's blessing. God Almighty, God most merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace as you continue to follow Jesus. Thanks be to God.